Okay, now that we've covered a few tricks with the moles and got familiar with the moles, we're going to look at a, a number of other ways that we can use moles to work out quantities, uh, masses and volumes. Okay, so the first one here is to calculate how much we should have got. We call that percent yield, or we can use percent error as also as a similar calculation that we can have down here. So how do we do this? We Again, we just use the balanced equation and work out the theoretical, so how much we should have got, and then we then we can then compare it with that previous formula. Okay, so here's the first problem here. 45 grams of ammonia came from 40 two grams of nit uh, nitrogen. So we have the balanced equation done for us and so we need to work out how much we should have got. So if we grab 42 grams of nitrogen that gives us a number of moles as 1.5 and so what we should have got uh, is three moles of ammonia uh, and the mass of that is uh, over here is 51 grams and so we got 45 so you divide that by the divide 45 by 51 and then you get your final answer as 80 8%. The next thing we need to look at is how do you work out which one is the limiting reactant. So far we've just told you which one it is or the other ones in excess. And why do you need to know limiting reactant? You need to learn limiting reactant because that will determine how much product you will get. You're only going to get as much product as the first thing that's going to run out. So first thing you need to do to find it is very is pretty much the stoichiometry of it. What you're going to do is look at the moles of both reactants and work out which reactant's going to run out first. So here's a problem. You have 2.5 by 10 to 3 kilograms of methane mixed with 3 by 10 to 3 kilograms of water. Which one's the limiting reactant? And so what we need to do is work out the number of moles of both. You can see from the equation that it's 1 is to 1. And so if we have 1.5 and 1.6, the smallest one is the 1.5. And so methane must run out first. And that's the limiting reagent. So that's the only one that we will use because there'll be excess water. And because of the ratio of the equations, everything has that amount of moles coming from it. So carbon dioxide will get 2.8 by 10 to the 6 grams. We'll get 3.13 uh, 3 by 10 to 5 grams of hydrogen. And so we have initially 1.66, and so we only need 1.5. So that only gives us one. Uh, that gives us 1.1037 left over. So if we work out the mass of that, we get to a final answer that we will have 1.8 by 10 to the 5 grams of water left over. Moving on to gases now, there is the stoichiometry ratio and then we have the gas law. So let's do the stoichiometry first. In IB they've used these as the reference values, so standard temperature and pressure values, a thousand kilopascals. It's good to know that one atmosphere is is 101,300 pascals. You need to know that, that's coming up in a second. And so at the same temperature and pressure, equal volumes of gases contain the same number of particles. Uh, so one molar gas gives us 22.7 liters. Make sure you, you know these well. I find sometimes it takes students a while to get used to this. A mil is the same as a centimeter cubed, uh, which will be the same as one gram liter for thermochemistry. And, and so one liter is one decimeter cubed, a thousand centimeter cubed is a decimeter cubed. Uh, similarly, for the strategy, just simply, if you're starting with volumes, you'll do conversion to moles, use the mole ratio, and then convert back out to moles to give us a volume again. So here is a problem. Quick lime is produced by de decomposition. Tell me the volume of CO2 gas given 152 grams of calcium carbonate. Uh, you do the balanced equation, it's all one molar. So calcium carbonate, 152 grams, gives us 1.52 moles, which means we have 1.25 moles of carbon dioxide. We then times that out, it's a ratio. Uh, you could do cross multiplication, one mole is to 22.7, so 1.5 moles is to how many litres, so when you times that out, or you could turn that into a formula like here, that gives you 34.5 decimeters cubed. Now we move into the gas laws, which we're all going to combine. So uh, the first assumption is we have an ideal gas, which means the particles are in random motion. The volume occupied by the gas particles is negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas, which means uh, it's mainly, mainly space. There is no forces of attraction between the particles. All the collisions between the particles uh, and the walls are perfectly elastic. And the average kinetic energy of the particles is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. So they are the gas rules, which can be broken if I just jump down. As you will see here, uh, the exceptions to the rule, the fact is when you take out too much kinetic energy, the intermolecular forces of these gas particles actually does have an effect. And so you can see that these massive curving off coming. So when you need to cool the temperature, here the actual the particles actually have some sticking together and so you need to know that this ideal gas law 
isn't actually ideal for certain ranges of temperatures. The first law we're going to look at is Boyle's law and you can see here this one is the only one that's curved. Uh, you'll know if you push down on a syringe you would get to a point where you just can't squish it any further so you know it's exponential and to get that to a straight line you could graph one over volume and that will convert it into a straight line. So Boyle's law is represented by this equation here P1 V1 equals P2 V2 so pressure and volume in one circumstance will be equal to the pressure and volume in a second circumstance. The same here's a diagrammatic representation of that um, and so we have the second one Charles law this one here is with volume and temperature so as you increase the temperature you increase the volume and there's the equation here volume over temperature uh, and lastly gay lussacs law is a pressure and temperature relationship. Out of interest too is Lord Kelvin. The way we get the Kelvin is if we extrapolate out with this pressure and temperature and we get to virtually no pressure at all, which means particles have stopped. We then use that to theorize that that is where temperature actually is actually zero. So that's where Kelvin comes from, these gas laws. Now what we do is we combine all of those gas laws together and we get this equation PV equals NRT. The gas law is constant so you can throw the N and the T under here and so you can get this PV on NT so you can actually find out what these laws are by realizing the gas constant The gas constant is here, throwing these underneath. So if you're dealing with just pressure and temperature you can cross out these so you know it's P on T equals P on T. Uh, Okay, so that's one thing you can do with the ideal gas law. And most importantly is what students have most problems with is that these units are slightly different to our stoichiometry. We're not using decimeters cubed, we use, uh, we're using meters cubed. And so there's a factor of a thousand. If you do the math on that, if it's centimeters cubed to meters cubed, it's actually a factor of a million. Another big thing uh, is the pressure is in pascals. I uh, know those conversions there and temperature is in Kelvin. So these unit conversions really stuff people up quite a lot uh, and they often get these questions wrong. Okay, so the first problem is um, just a, a simple uh, pressure volume problem. Uh, so you use the, uh, the com combination of the ideal gas law to get P1 uh, V1 equals P2 V2. Um, and so you can sub those in and, and you should realize that uh, because the pressure is decreasing, the volume should increase. Uh, and so you go from two centimeters cubed to six centimeters cubed. Uh, so the volume of the bubble is getting bigger and, and that will cause, that could possibly cause death and various other blockages in your blood system called the bends. The second problem here is using the PV equals NRT equation. You have a list of conditions here. It's most important here that you've changed the pressure to pascals. You've changed the volume to meters cubed and the temperature to Kelvin. Once you've done that, you can do your substitution. The gas law R is in your data booklet and that gives you a final value of 0.57 moles. This here is a little extra, but it seems to pop up importantly in different places throughout the syllabus. So I'm going to mention it here in the video, Dalton's law of partial pressures. When we talk about the, the percentage in a gas, uh, we, we do that just as exactly as that as a percentage. And the total pressure of the gas is the partial pressure of each of the individual gases. And so here you go, the partial pressure of, of any of these individual components um, is the percentage times the total pressure because these these are ideal gases and so they they act as as one so there's they're particles they're all acting as similar particles according to the ideal gas law so looking at a problem here if a balloon contains 0.2 moles of nitrogen and 0.5 moles of oxygen uh, what's the total pressure in the in the balloon and the total pressure in the balloon is two atmospheres how much pressure is the oxygen causing uh, and so if you look through this. Uh, the partial pressure of oxygen will, will be the total pressure times its percent contribution which is 0.5 of 0.7 uh, and so oxygen is uh, contributing 1.5 atmospheres of, of pressure to this balloon. Moving on to liquids now, we'll do concentrations first and then titrations. Just going over the terminology first, hopefully this is revision. Uh, the solute uh, dissolves in the solvent such as salt dissolving in water to make a solution such as seawater, and the concentration is the amount of solute in that solution. So the formula that we're going to use here are the, a revision of the conversions. Is concentration is number of moles on volume. You can either write the C and put the brackets in there or do the square brackets. Concentration can be written in these forms. This is called molar, 
uh, and that means just moles per litre or moles per decimeters cubed. Another one that comes up reasonably often is parts per million too, and that's basically the number of milligrams of solute in a, in a litre of solvent. So that's 10 to the minus 3 and that's 10 to the 3. So there's, there's six zeros in there, so that's a million. So that's the, uh, the number of bits per million, and that's in mass. Similar is the liquids uh, strategies, was, was the mass and volume strategy. These can be interchanged all right, with the mass and the volume depending on what you're given, and this can be interchanged depending on what they want at the end. So just simply if we're just dealing with and finishing with concentrations, get it to moles, use the ratio, get back to get back to the from moles back to what you want uh, in this one, it's concentration. So in the first problem here, 2.65 grams of sodium carbonate in 200 mils. What's the concentration of that? And so 2.65 grams is 0.025 moles. So the concentration moles per uh, volume and that will give us a total value of 0.125 moles per litre. The next problem here, what mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate would be required to prepare 100 mils of 2 molar solution? This is important for your experiments, uh, working out what you need and how to calculate it. And so concentration is number of moles on volume and we don't even need to uh, rearrange, we can just put those numbers in there and rearrange it later. And so that gives us uh, 0.2 moles is what we need. How do we get 0.2 moles? We need one. Uh, we need 16.8 grams and divide th and dilute that in 100 mils and that will give us our 2 molar solution. This is all kind of building up to titrations which is one of the most common ways that we actually measure substances in the laboratory. Going through the terminology, what we're going to use is something of a known concentration uh, and because we know that concentration and work out how much of that known concentration is used, we can use the balanced equation to work out what the concentration of the unknown is. And so that's called the titrant and we're measuring it with the unknown concentration which is the analyte aliquot or titrate here. Often we know the the reaction is finished because we have some sort of chemical that changes color and we call that the end point, the equivalence point and we get it to within one drop and so this this substance of known concentration is often called the standard solution or the primary standard and that is regarded as 100% accurate so you don't need to do errors for your uh, experimental write-ups. So quite a lot of terms here and a lot that sort of overlap and so if you're confused go back and, and have a look at this slide here to see what it's talking about if you're reading a method. The apparatus here, burette, volumetric flask, volumetric uh, pipette, partial pipette and conical flask, uh, we'll be using those when we do our titrations. Just a, a quick overview now before I show you. Always rinse your analytical glassware with the solution you're going to use. That will help dilute out any impurities or get rid of any water or anything. Uh, it's better than uh, rinsing it with anything else. Uh, so rinse it with what you're going to use. Make sure the meniscus always just touches the line where you need it to be. Make sure it's always vertical. Make sure this is a 45 degree angle and make sure you leave it for uh, two or three seconds. Uh, it's calibrated to have a little bit remaining in the tip, so that's fine. Similarly with your burette, rinse it with the solution you're going to use. Make sure there's no air bubbles there. Make sure you the meniscus there and most importantly, read it to half the smallest increment. The volumetric flask is a little bit trickier in that when you measure this here, you've got to get the remaining bits out. So you need to rinse that out uh, with a water bottle rinse this bit out too. Make sure it's not full. Mix it first. Make sure it's dissolved first so that you can mix it thoroughly. Once it's thoroughly mixed you can then top it up and fill it up with a pipette and do it to the meniscus and that will be your standard solution. It's important to know how to uh, get a solution of the correct dilution that you want. In order to do this we use this formula C1V1 equals C2V2 because the number of moles of solute will stay the same we can just increase the volume when we come up with a new concentration. And so let's have a look at how we use this formula. To calculate the volume of a 12 molar HCl solution that should be diluted with distilled water to obtain 50 mils of a 1 molar solution. So we use C1V1 equals C2V2 and that comes up with 0 0.004 uh, centimeters cubed mils. So what we do with that is we grab 4 mils of this 12 molar solution and we dilute it out to 1 litre and that then gives us 1 litre of 0.05 molar HCl. And just as a side note here, for very strong acids um, you really should add the acid to the water so there's no explosion because uh, if you add water to acid it is very concentrated mix still. Uh, if you add the acid to the water, uh, it's a very dilute acid building up in concentration, so it's much safer and won't explode as it releases heat. 
Lastly is a proper titrations calculation and so this is what you should be doing when you do your titrations. So we have 20 mils of sulfuric acid titrate was neutralized with 25 mils of 0.1 mol of sodium hydroxide standard solution. So we're trying to work out what the concentration of this sulfuric acid is. So there's our equation that's been balanced and so what we ended up using was 0.0025 moles of sodium hydroxide. So that must mean that what well, there was 0.001 Two five moles of H2SO4. And so by taking uh, the volume there, we can now work out what the concentration of sulfuric acid was, which was 0.0625 moles.